the Swiss Army knife is a great analogy because it's it's kind of bad at everything, but it's also kind of like kind of good at stuff. It's got like a tiny knife and a tiny scissors and a tiny you know tiny you know tiny tweezers. It's not a a a, a perfect uh, at everything thing, but it's got a real good general sense and it'll let you survive. So I want people to become a Swiss Army knife yeah. developer. to the Free Code Camp podcast. I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of freecodecamp.org. Each week we're bringing you insight from developers, founders, and ambitious people getting into tech. This week we're joined by none other than Scott Hanselman. Scott's a developer at Microsoft, a prolific teacher, and he's hosted the Hanselman podcast for nearly two decades. Scott, how's it going, man? Chilling. How are you, sir? I am thrilled to finally sit down and talk with you on the podcast. Uh, I was actually in Portland a while back, and it just happened to be a time that you weren't in Portland, so we couldn't record in person. But now we switched to video podcasts uh, and uh, just recording remotely. So I'm thrilled to finally have you on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for uh, hanging out. What do you got going back there behind you? That's uh, you're on attract mode on your Super Nintendo. This, uh, I do have a Super Nintendo back there, but uh, Jeff Atwood gave me this uh, arcade box. It's like basically a main machine type thing, and it just has a lot of arcade emulators, so I like to put different uh, games on in the background. Uh, this is an audio podcast for some and maybe a video for others, but I'm holding up a see-through monster joysticks, uh, plexi basically an acrylic uh, main machine. I've got a main machine behind me. I've got another one that's a Raspberry Pi inside oh, of a wow. mini arcade. And then I've got a full miniature Street Fighter here. And then I've got this one plus this one. So I've got about 14 or 15 uh, arcades in this room. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge fan of arcades. I grew up, you know, in the, in the early 80s, like going to arcades and, you know, playing Bionic Commando, playing Shinobi, playing a lot of the, the kind of golden age or like... Right after the Golden Age, I guess the Golden Age is like, uh, you know, like Space Invaders and Pong and stuff like that. But like once the tech was good enough that they could have really exciting, you know, side scrolling games and things like that. What kind of games do you play other than, of course, fighting games? It looked like that arcade stick would be really well suited to playing Street Fighter. Um, the the games that the classic games that I like are what you would call a shmup, a shoot 'em up. Mm -hmm. Or a bullet hell, Japanese bullet hell games, where it's basically like you know, one of the first ones was 1943, but like the 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 ones where there's so many bullets coming at you on the screen that you have to find a single pixel pass through them, and there's like you have a a little guy who's your uh, your ship, but he has one one heart pixel, which is the like as long as you keep that one pixel okay and you're moving it around, yeah, he's all right. And then of course you know Neo Geo, anything Neo Geo is great. I was on TikTok Live a couple of days ago uh, setting up my uh, Dreamcast. Uh, and I just, I just literally got uh, a couple of days ago a... Um, I'm pulling this over from the other... Here we go. This is a Retro Tink ah. 4K. This is a 4K upscaler that takes basically any classic input and up, upscales it to 4K. So, I so was like sprite-based games? How does, it, how does it do that? How does it add information? Like... So let me plug it back in. It's it's a really interesting thing. Like we, we came, we're, we're, on, we're talking about free code camp here, but I can't have an object like that, whether it be a joystick with a Raspberry Pi inside or an upscaler without thinking about the science behind it, right? So when you start digging into like, oh, it's a box and you plug things in and it makes the screen look better. Like that's the, that's the yeah. business, right? But you've got analog what are called RCA plugs here. So this yellow one is where video is input, white is left, and red is white. And it's basically like six wires, the inside and the outside. How is that encoded? Is a, is a Super Nintendo sending out 
240 scan lines? Is it doing it interlaced? Is it doing it progressive? Is it doing it 30 times a second or 50 times or 60 times a second? How do you output that to, to HDMI on a modern 4K screen in a way that is consistent and has minimal, um, uh, you know, minimal loss? But also, what is the intent? Is the intent to sharpen everything and crispen everything where you can apply algorithms and filters? Is the intent to make it look the way it looked on a Sony Trinitron CRT with scan lines? Yeah. Because one of the philosophies that you you have a pixel game behind you that's running, yeah. which looks like a shmup, in fact. The, um, the artist designed the pixel art not to look like the way young people think pixel art looks. They designed it because the way that the cathode ray tubes had the scan lines, they counted on bloom and they counted on blurriness. So they would design the pixels to look that way. But now we're used to like, oh, I want the Christmas Mario. That's not the way the designer intended it. They wanted him to look kind of smooth and funky and he'll look weird and pixely if you do a, what's called a 2X or a 4X upscaler. Right, but if you upscale it with the different algorithms, and the 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 retro tink is a very high end kind of obnoxious uh, piece of equipment, um, you can make a 4K display look exactly the way you remember a 13 inch CRT in your parents' basement look, and they yeah. do all of that with multiple layers of filters and algorithms that you would only have the processing power for in 2024. I know that's a big long speech at the beginning mm -hmm. of our no. podcast, but. They do that with a whole heck of a lot of work, and they do it in less than 10 milliseconds. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, well, I will definitely look into retro tinks. Uh, and, uh, yeah, what I'm using here is just like a, one of those old Dell monitors that I got off eBay from, like, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001 or something. Right, when, right. when they first went to flat panel. It's not quite as authentic, obviously, as playing on so, a cathode. Yeah, so that's the same exact thing that's in here. It's the, it's the very last Dell a uh, 4 by 3 1080p monitor. Yeah. What you can do now is take a 4K monitor, which gives you four times the resolution, and then apply one of these filters, and then even warp it and give a, uh, a scan line, give a raster view, and it is indistinguishable from a CRT. And there's a really interesting video from Linus Talks Tech where he has a proper giant 27-inch you know, Sony with a curved screen, and he compares it next to a flat panel, and he now prefers... The CRT, so we have the the tech, and we have the the number of pixels to simulate that look and feel, and then arguably make it look the way that the uh, the artist wanted it. So there's yeah. really cool math there, and there's really cool tech, and that's a one a one person shop retro tink. Uh, it's it's yeah. just, just a gentleman who's passionate about about those upscalers. Yeah, I mean it's hard to find like more hardcore devs in any industry than you find in game development because. People get so passionate about games, and like you hear about like the the story of the creation of Spelunky, for example, which was all developed by like a single developer who did like the music, the sprite work. I think he did the music, and and you know, people get really fanatical about like this passion project, and and they bring it into the world, and and sometimes there's a community out there to support their work, and then they can make it into a sustained pursuit, like. Like the the two brothers that developed, uh, for example, what is it, uh, Dwarf Fortress, for example. They've been working on that yeah. for like 20 years. Well, you're familiar with the theory of a thousand true fans? Enlighten me. Okay. So the idea is that people over people in the in the creator economy people in the world of Instagram where you are algor you know the algorithm is designed to make you feel bad about yourself get uh, overly tense thinking that, well, I'm going to need millions of fans and I'm never going to be able to make this work and how will I survive? Da, 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 da. The theory of a thousand true fans is that if you can get a hundred bucks a year from a thousand people, that's a hundred thousand dollars and you can have a nice, you know, kind of middle lifestyle. Yeah. That means if you're an indie rock star, if you're a web comic person, if you're a dev, if you have a Patreon, you just need a thousand true fans. They'll come and see you if you're in their town. They'll buy your merch. They'll buy your T-shirts. You just need to get 100 bucks from those 1,000 people. And by putting it into a, a number like 1,000, which is just like 110 times, it becomes a, an amount of people that you can visualize. You know, we, right. Maybe you went to high school with 1,000 people. Maybe you know 1,000 people in your life. So um, 
it's an, it's an accessible and attainable goal as opposed to trying to get a million people on TikTok and then to get TikTok to give you $9 yeah. for a million views. Yeah. Well, that's a cool, um, that's a cool way of thinking about it. I mean, free CoCamp kind of operates that way in that we have, uh, about nearly 9,000 people who support us each month. Uh, mm -hmm. and they're just giving us $5, $10, but that is able to enable this charity to keep pushing forward and expanding our learning resources and pursuing our mission. That's exactly right. You are living the dream of a thousand true fans because yeah, it'd be great if a million people gave a dollar a month or whatever, but but people who deeply care are, are, are involved. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk about retro computing for, and video games. I do want to learn more about you, Scott, because you're somebody who's been teaching people how to code for decades at this point, And he's been working as a dev for decades and who has been running perhaps the longest running tech podcast. Is are there any tech podcasts that have been running longer than 18 years? I I don't know. Maybe. Uh, that's a good question. I've, I'm on show. I just finished recording show uh, 947. Yeah, that's amazing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what inspired you to create that podcast to begin with. Did you ever have any <clears throat> notion that you'd still be doing it this much, this much time later? Did it feel like podcasts were just the new thing and you were just jumping on a trend or no, what was the impetus? I I started it because my buddy Carl Franklin was giving me a hard time. I think his might be on a longer running podcast, .NET Rocks. Uh, they're in the, in the thousands, although he does a couple of shows a week. Um, for me, he, we were, I was teasing him saying that podcasts were garbage because they were a waste of time and they had no information density, uh, which I was teasing you about uh, uh, earlier. And he says, well, then you should start a podcast, shouldn't you? Like, if you don't like podcasts... Because kind of, podcasts early on were talk radio, and I found like you know um, what's that guy Howard Stern and those kind of shows to be somewhat rambly. Yeah. Uh, and I had a thirty-minute commute, and I wanted you know I can't sit in the driveway and listen for two or three hours to uh, people chat. So for me, I wanted some density. So I made a show that was thirty minutes tight, which was the the length of my commute and the and I did a little you know research and that's the average commute in America is 30 minutes and then I realized that people don't like it when you call them and say can I pick your brain I don't like that either like I don't want people to think I'm being a jerk or anything but when you call someone and say hey can I pick your brain there's no agenda it's an assumption that time is free and that everyone has you know there's there's only 52 weeks in a year like if you start thinking about life like that you realize you don't have a lot of weeks left so I can't just give everyone a lunch. Um, so I'm a little bit, you know, precious about my, my lunches and my dinners. I'd rather spend it with my kids and my family. So rather than saying, hey, can I pick your brain? You say, hey, can you come on my podcast? And then you record it and then you do a YouTube and you do a pamphlet and you do a transcript and you, you know, and then it, it's an opportunity for you to pick their brain with an agenda, with some research. You keep it at a tight 30 minutes. It's information dense. Fast forward 20 years, and you've got 500 hours of, of tight content. And someone even made a, an AI bot where you can talk to the Hanselman it's bot um, and, and like ask questions of the last 20 years of tech and, and, and see if there was a show about it. That's awesome. So yeah, it was done as a rejection of modern podcasting. Okay, awesome. <laughs> and you stuck with that format. You're still very tight. Like it's, it's tightly edited. Like I listened to the episode where I was on. Uh, which was part of, uh, I, th I think it was part of .NET Conf. Yep. Uh, and that was a big honor, by the way. Thank you for inviting me on no, there. No, it's my pleasure. Um, and, and it sounded like you made me sound like the smartest person in the world, <laughs> like just bringing all my insights out and, and really, uh, yeah. And I used to do heavy editing on my podcast too. Uh, but like, I'd always feel daunted personally, like when I listen to heavily edited podcasts, cause I'm like, man, I'm like, especially cause I listen to du double speed. So everybody sounds like already twice as smart as I am. But once they're like, edited, it's even smarter. Right. It's all like, oh man, like well, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that it is highly edited. Mm -hmm. It is edited. It is professionally edited by a professional podcast editor, Mandy mm -hmm. Moore. Uh, Mandy is available for podcast editing. If anyone's listening and wants to hire Mandy, find me on Twitter and I'll put you in touch with her. She is a professional podcast producer. So I put raw audio into a Dropbox and a produced show pops out the other side. 
Um, and she's editing, you know, for Clarity, for UMS. But I also have been doing this for a minute, so I, I, I feel pretty confident in the ability to get good content out of good people. Yeah. And it's awesome. worked out so far. And, in, and it's sustainable because it's just every Thursday for the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, getting into a rhythm. Uh, similarly, like my email newsletter, which been, has been going seven years, uh, every single Thursday, get an yeah. email out. So Life is a marathon. If, you, if, if someone said, oh, you should start a podcast, yeah, just do it three times a week. That's, that's not sustainable. That's why people fail to work out because they go from zero days a week to five and then they stop. That's not a thing everyone can do. So twice a week, three times a week would not be a podcast that I could do. Yeah. Well, before we dive into talking about like learning to code and talking about uh, the .NET ecosystem, which we're going to talk a lot about, I'd like to just talk with you a little bit about Portland, the city that you live in, uh, where you've been for quite a while, and uh, why Portland? I was born in Portland. And you, you know, Seattle's just like right up there, and there are like lots still, of big tech and companies. And still not better. And still not better, is it? <laughs> no, uh, my my, you know, my family came here, and uh, they landed in like 1906, and spun on their heel, and said, "We're in Portland now." Uh, I've been here. My grandparents are here. My uh, my dad is here. My mom and dad are here. Whole family's here. Portland has a great airport, has great public transportation, has great uh, electric train. Uh, you can you can drive an hour and get to the mountains. You can drive an hour and get to the beach. There's a half dozen universities here. I have no interest in being anywhere else. Awesome. Well, that is quite a uh, no. That's a nice clean answer, right? Yeah. It's like I've I've filled three passports. I've got all the stamps. I've been to I don't know 38 countries. But um, Portland is a very my has a very mild, uh, very mild climate. And uh, you've got Intel, you've got Nike World Headquarters here. Uh, I've worked for Microsoft for 15 years remotely from my, my home in Oregon. So, yeah, Portland's wow. a pretty cool place. So at no point did they say, hey, we, we need you to, like, relocate? <laughs> nope. You were just – that's pretty cool. You Is that – common at microsoft for people to just like, yeah, 15, even way back 15, then 15 years ago no it was not common 15 years ago it is totally common now my entire team is remote some of them i don't even know where they live yeah and like how do you work i guess uh free code camp's fully remote so i don't want to sound like i'm a critic of uh remote work or anything mm -hmm. but like for people who are used to working in offices or managers who are listening to this who are a little bit worried about remote work maybe you could take a moment to talk about the benefits like the trade-offs that you all face as a remote team well i think that being remote requires a, a level of uh emotional maturity that no one gives you uh preparation for you know you can be one can get lonely working remotely so you have to figure out where your energy from comes from there needs to be a certain amount of conscious focused internal conversation with oneself about what feeds their spirit if if you know sitting on your kitchen counter with a laptop is not going to you know feed your spirit then that's going to be a problem and you're very quickly going to regret it but at the same time if a 90 minute commute into the next city is going to be soul crushingly sad that's also a problem yeah so i will go sit at mcdonald's and i will go sit at you know at chipotle and i will use their wi-fi and i will hang out and get energy. I'll sometimes I'll go and sit at the mall in the food court. A uh, couple of times a year, I will drive up to Seattle and hang out with folks. Uh, there's a local Portland office, which is like a little sales office. And I'll go and, you know, I don't drink coffee, but they have a kitchen. So I can just be somewhere where there are humans, but that can also be sitting in a park. But my job as a, as a, a program manager at Microsoft, and they have a they have a, a, these three things that Satya says. Your job is to uh, create clarity, generate energy, and deliver results. Now, that sounds squishy, but the idea is how do you get people to do a thing, right? You're, you're a program manager. You have a program. You have a thing, an initiative. Mm -hmm. A program is just an initiative, and you want to manage, meaning move forward and herd all of the cats into all these cats that are running around the field. And you're like, okay, okay we're going in that direction. Well, I don't understand what's going on. All right, let's create some clarity. Here's the goal. All right, this is good. Now convince me it's a good idea. Generate energy. A recent example would be 
uh, Katie on my team working with yeah. you to get C a C sharp C sharp certification on Free Code Camp. So you can go to Free Code Camp or you can go to Microsoft and you can get a certification on, on behalf of us, on behalf of Microsoft and Free Code Camp. Everybody wins. But how did Katie, as a new graduate at Microsoft, from her apartment, do that? She's got to get people excited. She's got to write documents and explain it. She's got to get on phone calls. She's got to get on emails, generate energy, get clarity going. And then everyone goes, oh, man, that's a great idea. And she freaking did it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you uh, did too, remotely. Yeah. We corresponded. We had maybe like five or 10 meetings over the course of mm -hmm. development of that certification. And everything got done. And so, yeah, I really like this. Funny this. how that works. And you didn't have to fly <laughs> anywhere. No, uh, I still haven't met her in person. Hopefully I'll meet her in person. Hopefully I'll uh, meet you in person again. We did meet at Code Newbie way back. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the, the very first Codeland conference. Uh, yeah, so I'm curious about like what got you into software development uh, because you worked your way up through the entire software development ecosystem. You were like an architect for a while, and now you're managing other developers in addition to doing development yourself. Uh, like, what got you into programming? And do you remember around what age you started getting excited about programming? I've told this story before. When I was 11 or 12, they brought a Apple II to the, to the school. And it, it, this was a time when an Apple II was probably $3,500. Mm -hmm. um, this is big money. And there wasn't an Apple II like for each classroom. There was one for the building. So there wasn't, we weren't a school that had a lab. This was not a school with money. Uh, so there was this one computer, and I, I had a knack for that computer. I don't know why. It just it made sense. And I opened it up, and I looked inside, and I started to figure out what was going on. And Mrs. Hill, Marion Mayfield Hill, RIP, was a uh, my fifth grade teacher. And she allowed me and my dad, with a deal from the principal, to basically steal the, la the, the machine and take it home on a Friday night. Uh, he would back, my dad would back his pickup truck up against the building and we would borrow this machine as long as it was back by Sunday night. And that, that was an opportunity to use this machine and take it home in a, in a, in a time when we, that machine was worth 10x what the car was worth. Um, but I spent my weekends on that machine. And then uh, we, my dad had another car, which was a, a blue 1972 Ford Econoline van. Mm -hmm. and I was sitting out in the front of our house, and one day I came home, and the van was gone. And I went inside, and I said, wait, man, where's the van? And he said, we bought a computer at Sears. We got you a Commodore 64. It's apparently the big computer that everyone's talking about these days. And I still have it in the garage. I can go and get the box and show it to you. It's got Sears tape. Sears used to, when you buy something at Sears, they would have this tape that they would wrap around it like like a... Uh, I, like a yellow police tape, but it said Sears. Yeah, and it would it would prove to you that you bought it at Sears, and then when you go out the door, they know that you you know you didn't steal the thing because it's got the tape <laughs> around it. So I've got that that computer in the other room, and I've actually got a Commodore sixty four right here. All right, and I'll just uh, narrate. Uh, Scott has gotten up out of his seat, and whoa, it's it's built. It's the model that's built right into the keyboard. This is called the bread box or the bread bin, rather. Pardon me. And then I've got a fast load cartridge to make it go faster. That had 64K of RAM. I've got a couple of Commodore 64s, including an FPGA uh, re-implementation of a Commodore 64, which is a modern Commodore 64. They're making modern 64s in, in 2024. Yeah. And, uh, and then I've all, this is called a 6502 uh, microprocessor, and I've, I'm, I'm building a, an Apple I with a 6502 as a, as a hobby project over here on the floor. Awesome. So, yeah, that's where that started, and uh, and then I went and visited a bunch of schools, uh, thinking that I would maybe go to I don't know MIT or something fancy, but I was not emotionally ready for that, nor was I mature enough. So I visited some schools, uh, and I didn't think I could pull it off. So I instead moved into my parents' garage, and then I went to. Uh, a buddy of mine and I was like, man, I don't have anywhere to go to school. I'm screwed. Uh, somewhere in like 
April of my senior year because I had no plan. And I, uh, my buddy, his name is Jack Elmore, started teaching me C, and he taught me pointers in C. And he said, hey, you know, Portland Community College is doing a class. It's the very first software engineering cohort at Portland Community College. Do you want to, you and me will go there and we'll become the first, the first graduates of software engineering at not computer science. We should separate those two things. And I ended up spending about 11 years going to school and I finished my four year degree 11 years later working at night. 11 years. That's a, that's a substantial duration of say at Portland. Well, one of the funny things in the U S that maybe people don't realize is that when you are doing um, a degree, uh, there's a certain amount of time that it, you have to get that degree. Usually it's about six to seven years. So after seven years, your credit kind of rots or expires. So seven years in, I get this notification from the dean that I need to take writing 121 again. And and uh, I'm like, well, this is like English. It's like writing 121. And I said, can I can I give you some some writing samples? Can I how can I get out of this? And at this point, we're you know I'm 10 years into my career or seven or eight years into my career, and I'd already written books. So I was like, hey, I could give you one of the books that I've written. And that got me out of writing 121. I gave him like this rocks book. I think it was like. Um, I think it was Access 2000 Programming that I'd written, like one of the Red Rocks books. And then then other things started to, you know, like I'm, I'm taking longer and longer and longer to do my degree. So then um, at this point, I think it's 2000. I'm like eight or nine years out of school. I'm not out of school, out of high school, but I'm still trying to get my degree done. So then I said, well, there's this new language called C Sharp that's, that's, that's out in .NET. How about I teach a class? So I made a deal with the dean of the Oregon Institute of Technology to let me teach this class, and I was the first non-degreed adjunct professor. And if I kept teaching the class, they would let me have my, my credit not rot. And then I ended up graduating uh, 11 years later, and then they gave me like a Young Professional Achievement Award because I was teaching adjunct uh, at these, these universities. It was kind of cool. That's really cool. First of all, it's wild to me that uh... – that like their weird kind of backward. I mean, what a punitive policy for all the busy parents and other people out there that just don't have time to finish school. I think most people don't even finish school within six years anymore. Uh, so the fact that they, if they still have that policy, they need to get rid of it. Cause well, I mean, it, I get it, but I don't like, it's like some things end. like, for example, I'm looking at my degree, every language that I learned other than C is gone. Every operating system is gone. But so I get the idea, like this information isn't modern, but like writing, yeah, like writing one twenty one, like calculus. I don't think that should rot. You should be able to carry that around forever. So yeah, I ninety percent agree with you. Okay, well, uh, so you were able to eventually finish your degree, but by that point, you had already started working in the field. Obviously, you you were a published author in the technical book space. Maybe you can just briefly take us through some of your early roles and uh how you were able to get some of these obviously you hadn't finished your degree yet so you were able to get them without the degree in software engineering yeah that that's a tough one people when we hire at microsoft when i hire people i honestly don't look at their their degrees the the, the phrase that we have is an is an analogy you can tell me if you like this or not but when you're putting together a basketball team you usually want to focus on height so I want to hire tall people. I can teach them ball handling. I can teach them how to dribble. But if they're tall, they're probably going to be successful in basketball. That's a, as a general rule. Now, there are some successful small, small people in basketball. But as a general rule, hire for height. So then the question is, what does height mean? Again, I'm saying that in air quotes with my fingers here. When it means software, it means that if the person has this, if you get this sense that this person can do it, then they're tall. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, I don't, like, if you don't know C sharp, you know, JavaScript, but you get, you get it. You get computers. And this person's tall. We'll teach them the, whatever the other language is. So if, if you get JavaScript, I can teach you Ruby. If you get Ruby, I can teach you C sharp. So the question is, Quincy, how do you, ex how do you express to an interviewer that you are tall? How do you express that you get it? Is it, that you are a clear communicator? Is it that you understand systems and how things plug together? 
I really like this idea of systems thinking. Like, like if we go back to our retro tink callback, um, I probably couldn't code this, right? The per Mike who made the retro tink is clearly an amazing programmer, mathematician, but I understand all of the systems that make it happen. And I have a general kind of, I call it Swiss army knife level understanding which means that like the Swiss army knife is a great analogy because it's, it's kind of bad at everything, but it's also kind of like kind of good at stuff. It's got like a tiny knife and a tiny scissors and a tiny, you know, tiny, you know, tiny tweezers. It's not a, 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 a perfect, uh, at everything thing, but it's got a real good general sense and it'll let you survive. So I want people to become a Swiss army knife yeah. developer, but if you have no concept of, of like the scissors part, you yeah. should probably learn a little bit about scissors. You know, there's like a saw in here. There's like tw there's like pliers. Nail file. Swiss Army knife. Like, there's a bunch of cool stuff in here. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is the Swiss Army knife that my father gave me at age 12. This is the original. It's on my desk to remind me of that stuff. So while I can't tell you and explain the code behind this upscaler, I get all of the concepts from the electrons that are on the wire all the way up until it goes out to HDMI, and I have a 70% understanding of the system in which it exists. Yeah. And you do too, because I could tell you were nodding when we were talking about it. You know, I, yeah, I kind of get it in filters and how it works. So if someone comes into a job and they have a sense of like, well, here's how a website is generally architected. Here are the languages that are involved. I learned JavaScript at Free Code Camp, but I understand this website uses Python or C Sharp but the pieces are the same. Yeah. Oh, I drive a Toyota. Well, that's cool. I drive a Honda. That's cool. We, I can teach you how to drive Toyotas. Does that make sense? Does that yeah. analogy work? Yeah, that works. Uh, so to what would you attribute your systems knowledge and like, how did you build that up? Uh, professional curiosity. Like how can you not be excited? And that's a part that I don't know how to teach, but I want people to think about that. Like, um, you know, my 16-year-old my wanted to understand how the, uh, the, the faucet at the, at the um, airport knew that his hands were underneath it. Well, that's a whole interesting conversation about, like, what is it using? Is it using IR? Is it using radar? What's a motion detector? Like, is the thing in the faucet at the airport the same as the motion detector that, like, detects the door at Target? Then you start having conversations that there's a person, and this is fascinating to me, Quincy, there's a human being who designed the thing at Target that opens the door. Is it a plate in the floor? Like, that's an interesting question. Like, when you stand, it opens the door. Is it a motion detector? Some places it's a motion detector. Some places it's a button. Some places it's a plate in the ground. And then you can start talking about how do you solve that problem yeah. for the people? Yeah, and so, then you, you just can't stop thinking about systems. Yeah. And and so do you often ponder those things like when you, you know, are just doing so, let's say you're uh, opening, <laughs> for lack of a better example, this just came to mind. Let's say you're, uh, you're putting your luggage onto the radiator thing in the airport and it's going through there. Yeah, and it's, somebody it's scanning made like, that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, who, do you find yourself she? often pondering who? those things? Oh, yeah. Like every, every freaking day. How can you not? Like I was at McDonald's earlier. I'm holding up my, my $1 McDonald's Diet Coke. Who wrote the touchscreen with the button? Like someone designed that. Someone drew a picture of a soda, bitmap, PNG, I don't know. Someone yeah. at McDonald's is out there. If you go to McDonald's and there's like when you're going through the drive-thru, there's a sign on the wall with like a picture of like some food. There was a team that took a picture of that food, like a photographer, and they like, it's all fake and it's like not really mayonnaise, right? But there's a number at the bottom. Look at the lower right corner or the lower left corner of the McDonald's sign. It's like 01-0406. Someone at McDonald's they, they made that number. There's a marketer who's like, okay, all the McDonald's have to swap out for the new Cardi B burger. And that one's got this number. And then there's an, a person in Photoshop who drew that. Yeah. There's a printer who made it. Um, God, well, there's like a whole system. Well, at least one of the devs who worked on the McDonald's touchscreen UI went through free code camp because I saw them tweeting about that the other day. That's what I'm talking. That's fantastic, right? Yeah. Like this is the remote 
control for the retro tink and like you know you like if i hold that up in my um uh with my camera and like try to here's my here's my camera and you can see me on the camera and here's the remote control and like you can kind of see the light in behind it because it's ir yeah like that kind of stuff i just can't no, I, I can't see the IR. I can point it at my eyes, but if I can point it to the back of the camera, I can see it like, uh, you know, and then I can spend a whole weekend trying to figure that out. How do you teach people that? You I tell them that it exists and then you let them feel like you too can take apart the toaster. How did they make, I want warm bread. Let's go learn about how toasters work. Yeah. Yeah, I used to, I spent a great deal of time going down like rabbit holes on like howstuffworks.com back in, you know, the early 2000s and mm -hmm. learning about how wave pools work at the water park, uh, you know, learning about uh, how, you know, hydroelectric dams work. I mean, the world is filled with engineering and a lot of that, like you can draw from some form of problem and its solution, you can kind of draw analogies that you can use and implement in code too. So... I don't look at it as time squandered following flights of fancy. I often do have like analogous solutions to problems. And, and sometimes it's helpful when I need to communicate like a, a potential approach, just being interested in the world around me. Yeah. It, it sounds like you're intensely interested in the world around you. I am. And I also like, I'm overwhelmed by the layers of abstraction, right? There's layers on top of layers on top of layers. Uh, this, um, an interesting, if, uh, an interesting thing happened this weekend, if you don't mind, like yeah. a little story. Okay. So there's this guy you can Google with Bing for named Ray Ozzy. Ray Ozzy invented Lotus Notes. He's a famous computer scientist and he was the CTO of, uh, of Microsoft <clears throat> for a number of years. And, uh, this, this young person on online is really interested in old versions of DOS disk operating system, the operating system that came out before uh, Windows. And DOS uh, came out during a time as another operating system called CPM. And then IBM went off and made OS2, Operating System 2, and OS2 and Windows were like competing operating systems. So Ray Ozzy has this computer museum at his house. And you can find video of his computer museum online. And the young person was talking to Ray Ozzy and found they found a copy of DOS that has never been released. And it was like on a disc in Ray's, you know, Ray's uh, office. So I talked to Ray and he's, he sends me the discs because I said, I'll, I'll take, I'll see if I can get the material off of the discs. So these are on floppies. So I'm holding up like a floppy, floppy, floppy 5.5 inches. This is a 5.25 inch, 5.25 5 quarter inch floppy. And this is a three, this, this floppy has 360 K that's one frame of one of our videos. Like take a screenshot right. that's bigger than this floppy. Right. And you can see it says DS DD double sided, double density. There's single sided floppy, single density floppy. So you would have like 180 K floppy, a 320, a 360. We were eking out extra, extra bytes on floppies and then you'd get up to a 1.2 megabyte floppy which was just immense who could yeah. who could have such huge amounts of data Quincy? oh my god <laughs> right and then uh 100 1.44 meg was like the max but this was a 360k floppy so how do you get data off of a 360k floppy in 2024 my friend what do you think? Pro I mean, probably you just go get a really old drive or did they all rot? Do any of the drives well, still work? So you can get a really old drive, but really old drives don't plug into modern machines. <clears throat> so then a listener or yourself might say, well, just, just, I'm saying that in, in angry court, <laughs> just, you know, get a USB floppy. Well, USB five and a quarter inch floppies do not exist. It's not a thing. Uh, there are... Uh, 1.44 three and a quarter inch three and a half inch floppies rather you can buy a usb floppy but there's no way to to do that like modern floppies are um not a thing especially on on real floppies because this is yeah. literally ben bendy plus 
Um, we we just assume everything works because we plug our USB. Pl- you know, you take a USB and you plug it in, it works. Mac speaks DOS and DOS speak. You know, like everyone speaks the same thing. There are file systems. There's ext fat file allocation table. Mm-hmm. There's fat thirty two, and there's NTFS new technology file system. But for the most part, you plug a USB in and it kind of just works. Right. Right. Back in the day, there were. 50 different kinds of file systems and just a bunch of competing standards. Like every company was kind of like trying to make their own proprietary ecosystem. Everybody wanted to win and then FAT kind of won, but that's a file system that that's a, like a way to do directories and layouts and stuff like that, but it doesn't describe the actual how do you get the magnetic signals onto the disk and where do those sectors go and this thing is literally spinning rotating and there's a head that's floating over it all of those decisions that's even lower level like the layout of that system so if uh if i went and found like a i could find a windows 95 or win or windows 3.1 machine like go to like free geek or one of these older machines and try to find one then i could copy it onto the machine but then how would i get it off of that machine because those machines aren't on the internet and they don't have usb could you, could you like stair step it up different generations? Like right. maybe move it to 3.5 and then move it from the 3.5 so to. That's exactly what I was going to do. My idea was get it onto like an old Pentium or an old 486, go from three, uh, five inch to three and a half, and then from three and a half to USB, and then, and then go off. Um, I, so I went around though and found that there is a machine, there's a, there's a board, a custom board called a Grease Weasel. And this is a person who has made an open source and open hardware standard, Grease Weasel with a Z. And this is a USB-C to ribbon cable that you can then, and I went on eBay and I bought a, a, a drive. However, the part that I think is so fascinating about this is that this doesn't just turn into like the A drive or the B drive. It allows you to use a Python script at the command line to rip down the magnetic flux signals directly off the disk and put it in a binary file called an IMG, a, a floppy drive image. You know, people expect today to plug it in and it's going to mount. And I look, I have a drive and I can double click. But this is way, way, way earlier. These are, dude, these disks, these disks are from May of 1984. Yeah. That's 40 years ago. Like, so this is really cool to think about if you think about systems and layers. How long did it take to get us where I could take a USB and plug it into any computer on any operating system and see a text file? We 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 had to figure out text file um, uh, encoding. Is it 8-bit ASCII? Is it 7-bit ASCII? Is there line feeds? Are there carriage returns? What's a carriage? Why is it returning? This <laughs> Figuring out line endings. That's a lot to do with like, slapping the typewriter when you get to the end of a line, oh, right? dude, <laughs> look at this. Hang on. Okay, okay. He's getting back up. Uh, for, for those of you listening and that don't have the video, he just happily kind of pranced off, and now he's back. And now I've got a typewriter. This is a Lego typewriter. Lego. So, like carriage return and line feed. On Windows, if you have a text file and you type and you press enter, you get a carriage return and a line feed. Yeah. On on a on a Linux machine, you get a line feed, and on early Macs, you get a carriage return. What's a carriage? The carriage is the thing that holds the paper on the typewriter. It's being carried, and the carriage returns after it's being typed on. You go click, 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 and the carriage moves, and then you have to push the carriage return, which then goes bing, <laughs> and returns the carriage to its previous location, and then the line feed moves the paper those codes were needed to move the typewriter so if you're learning git on free code camp and you're wondering why am i thinking about carriage returns and line feeds in 2024 it's because 50 years ago they were needed to move the paper on the printer and honestly it goes back almost 60 or 70 years yeah i mean so many of the systems we have in place today are just the result of legacy like the i've heard that the width of roads of railroads is because that's how wide Roman roads were 
two thousand years ago. So they just, yep, exactly. even though it would probably be better t- for the railroads to be a little bit wider, so they would do rail less often. That was the Dang. standard, and you know, it was too much work to get people to adopt a whole new standard. So they've just had the same standard yeah. in place for two thousand years. So I went to my buddy, my buddy's house, and he had a Pentium, an old Pentium computer, and we loaded up a copy of DOS six. Uh, from the mid, uh, I want to say 1989, mm-hmm. 1980, 1990, and we copied um, this onto an uh, onto an IDE. Uh, I think it's integrated drive something IDE. Uh, we copied onto a dr- an IDE drive with a compact flash card. Apparently, compact flash is the bridge. I was thinking USB. I was thinking floppies, but compact flash or CF cards that you see in like in a big fancy camera, those are the best cards there are because there's like tiny versions and there's like 64 gig versions and he uses compact flash to move his things around and we recovered the data off of those 40 year old discs that ray ozzy gave us and now i'm going to work with uh microsoft and ibm to try to get the the data that is on those discs from ray ozzy's uh garage and have that open sourced that's really cool so you're participating directly in computer history like you go to silicon valley uh, Mountain View, the Computer History Museum, which I went to earlier this year. Uh, and, uh, like, you're one of the people that is kind of, like, playing a small part in helping preserve and yeah, uh, discover, yeah. like, different quirks. Because everything yeah. was moving so uh, fast. Things were happening so fast, right? said he wants me to talk to the Computer History Museum. So I want to, frankly, if, if I can, someday, I want to fly to Ray's house, take my buddy uh, with me, and we'll go and, like, dump everything out of his garage because that's 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 important history so that actually is another callback to like this your your interest and my interest in retro gaming preserving and understanding history matters and if you are a person who does free code camp and you maybe you're an emerging engineer or you're a career switcher or you're a young person who's getting started knowing a little bit about the why you don't have to know all this stuff you know these are two weirdos on a podcast talking about old stuff but like just a little bit of like read a Wikipedia page. Oh, that's what carriage return is. Didn't know that, huh? You would be surprised how often little weird stuff comes up. Oh, why is this thing that way? Why is HTML like this? JavaScript. Why does JavaScript suck? Because that's <laughs> what happened. Because Brendan wrote it in a weekend, and now it's the language we have, right? Th- those little bits of history uh, will go. Will make you go, hmm. Isn't that a thing? Yeah. Well, you're a big advocate of like staying humble and and just learning about the world around you, not presuming. Uh, how have you cultivated those faculties? Like, uh, <laughs> I guess, are there any things, like any heuristics or, or general rules that you apply to like guide your learning? And how do you? I guess, how do you know when to stop learning and stop going too deep in the rabbit hole because you've got to go get some other work done? Mm, that's a good question. I think when I get a headache. That's usually a time to take a break. You know what I mean? Like you can't know everything. Like I like I go to my I went to my buddy Jeff's house and like he was helping me figure this stuff out. And like you know I'm a, I'm a pretty smart guy. Like I'm a, like a like a seven, and like this guy's freaking nine or ten. Like I just he's just vibrating with knowledge. You know, like when you meet someone who's just so smart, it like it must hurt to carry that brain around. You know, your back must hurt from carrying your giant brain. Yeah. Um, it's always cool to hang out with and surround yourself with smarter people because they'll make you better. Uh, but I know my limitations, you know, like I can solder, but I'm, I'm not really good with an oscilloscope. Like I can, when they say full stack engineer, we always joke about like how far, how far <laughs> down do you go? Do you make your own chips? Do you make and design your own chips? Do you smelt your own iron? You know what I mean? Like, are you going to go to like a Renaissance fair, get a big rock and turn it into a chip? Like, how I just wanted to say hello world, right? Like I went to free coke camp. I want to say hello world. Yeah, but did you did you find a rock, like and smelt? You know, like yeah. How what is a full stack engineer anyway? You know yeah, I mean, I mean we we kind of have to practically draw the line at okay. You know how to use scripting languages, operating systems, database, version control, these kind of more contemporary tools. But you know, I always tell people like it's it's like an ocean history, systems knowledge, things like that. You can absolutely explore it all you probably have time in your life to become very learned about these things but for most people they're the practical reality is they want to be able to get a job as a developer and exactly and so so, finding that balance that's a great point 
when do you stop when you don't think it's going to help you find a job? Yeah. And so that's a good balance. Yeah. One of the things I'm curious about is like how you got your first job in tech, especially not having a university degree living in Portland, which, you know, is a city with a lot of industry, but is not historically like Silicon Valley or Seattle or Austin, Texas, or or I guess I should say Dallas, Texas, since we're talking about the old, the old tech, the Silicon Prairie, right? Portland Portland in the nineties had pretty decent tech. Like I say, Tektronix was there. Nike was there. Intel was there. Oh, okay. I didn't realize Intel was there. Yeah, yeah. Intel is a huge, huge Intel campus just like down the, down the street. Um, but I ended up working, I think, my first tech job. Well, so I had a little tiny business, though, because people would carry – before before the cloud, people would carry their homework around on disks. And you'd have a disk, and then you would end up losing your homework. And there was a program called Disk Doctor that would go and – you know, rip your, it would would recover your deleted homework. So I would charge people five bucks to run disk doctor on their disks. And I ended up calling that company tweak computer support. And you can go and find, um, mouse pads and business cards from my, my company. And then I made a bulletin board, which was a pre internet place that you could call in and leave messages for your friends. And I had tweak computer support, BBS bulletin board system. Yeah. That was all like done in my parents' garage, and those were like registered businesses when I was like 15 or 16. So that hobby work, that just weird stuff, people don't give themselves credit for not being for being able to put that on their resume. Like if you made your church's website or you made an app for your kids' little league, that's resume. You know, you do a you do a thing for free code camp, you do a certification that goes on the resume. You know, there's a problem. There was a guy. At, uh, at Quiznos, small business owner. I would go to Quiznos to get a sandwich and he wanted to be able to take orders over the internet. So I made him a internet ordering system because he's just a small business owner. Like Quiznos is a franchise, but I solved that. Put it on the resume. You know what I mean? Like those little moments all add up and then being able to have stories. So a tutorial that you did, a little problem that you made, a little funny robot, all of those things are the stories that build up who you are so that when you go to the interview, you can talk about those things and you can, you know, come off as somewhat credible. So I got an internship at a company called Chrome data that did, um, make model style car data. And you would call Chrome data and say, I want a car fax. And then we would go and generate a word document and then fax it to you. I built that. And I think they were paying me 10 bucks an hour. And I remember sitting at, at, at Quiznos, uh, asking my boss for a two dollar raise to get from ten dollars an hour to twelve dollars an hour, um, and I was doing work in C, C plus plus, and then Visual Basic three at the time. This would have been like nineteen ninety two or three. Yeah, wow, Quiznos. I love Quiznos, but they don't have any here in Dallas. In fact, I've heard the Quiznos kind of like fell off, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but that's so cool that you were able to create uh, a system because you know those franchises like they don't necessarily get the best support from corporate and to a lot of maybe he requested to corporate. Hey, can we have an ordering system and nobody listened? Yeah. But, at that time, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a guy who poured his entire life savings into a sandwich shop. I'm, I'm a big fan of small businesses. I know you wouldn't think of Quiznos as one, but like franchise owners are small business owners. So I always befriend the people at the shops and try to help them with whatever. So, uh, I, I, I did a lot of menu. I did menus at Ethiopian restaurants. They needed like, because Ethiopian is a really interesting language, and they have their own, their own character set and their own font. So he had been writing the menus in English on like Word, and then in pen, drawing the characters. Uh-huh. I was like, no, we can solve this. Let's let's find a font. You know what I mean? Like little problems like that all add up and get put on the resume. Yeah, that's cool. So you were basically like kind of like the the Swiss Army knife kid around town who would just like call did, back. did were would business owners talk to one another would they be like hey just call in scott he could probably figure it out like yeah that 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 actually ended up happening like even even now at, like people will just there's a guy i've been helping i don't even think he knows that i'm a vp at microsoft and he'll just text me and be like oh, the printer's not working and i've been helping this guy and his family for like 20 <laughs> years so i'll just go over and i'll just like fix the printer that's cool you know what i mean he, he's the this, this nice young man works at microsoft well, obviously, like, 
I, I want to get through the autobiographical stuff because I know you, there's like so many actual insights we can pull out of you. Uh, as you and I are both fans of saying, I believe, because I've listened to a lot of episodes of Hansel Minutes, you know, people's advice is very much informed by their own lived experience, who they mm. are, uh, you know, how people treat me is different than how they're going to treat, you know, a person who just came from a different country and, and has limited command of English or something like that. Right. Or, uh, sure, sure. There are all these different dimensions. I'm curious though, like what your progression was, your career progression. So you went from being kind of Mr. Fix it, like, uh, technology, like systems design kid. Yeah. Kind of an IT support yeah. person for, for the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point. I like that question. So, yeah, your IT support for the neighborhood, you're asking questions about toasters and printers and wires and like, like, you know, I was holding up this, this ribbon cable before yeah. for the floppy. Like this was a time when you could, when each one of these wires had signal on it that you could take apart and look at, like you could see data. We're not, we're not in a time right now where you can see data moving from place to place. It's all kind of in the air. That's what they tell you. But in fact, you can get a flipper zero or you can get a, you can look at signals. Like I was a big believer from early on that nothing is invisible. So right now people, you know, you, you push a button and a miracle happens. Or you talk to Siri and a miracle happens. And we believe that these things are invisible. Systems thinkers and myself try to remind ourselves that there's, there's visible, observable signals, whether they be in the air or on a wire, or on a piece of silicon, or in an application like Postman that lets you look at yep. HTTP, or when you press F12 in Chrome and you're like, oh, look at that. I can see the, the source code. That's a reminder that nothing is hidden from you. So I think that that was built up by fixing floppies and plugging in network cables and then building my way up to um, going to PCC, Portland Community College, learning how to write Hello World in C with Charles Petzold's Windows book, and then going and presenting that in a somewhat competent, this kid's got moxie kind of a way. So uh, like enthusiasm can't be faked. You know what I mean? Try to truly be gen you know, generally uh, excited about what you're doing. And people will be like, ah, yeah, this, I like this kid. My my nephew uh, is 21. He's in the middle of a degree in electrical engineering, and he got an internship just based on, wow, this kid's excited and fascinated about about electrical engineering and systems. So, you know, interviewing well means practicing. He did a lot of practice interviews. I did a lot of practice interviews. Um, I think it can be really challenging. A lot of people feel like, I don't interview well. Yeah. Because you just over, you get over over stimulated overthinking. So I try to, you know, teach my kids, my young, my young sons, 16 and 18 to talk to humans. Cause that's a muscle like being an introvert's a thing, you know, you know, but you can train yourself to also be an introvert who can turn on for a half an hour and make it work. Don't you think like interview skills, I think are not talked about enough. Yeah. Um, I, I almost feel like, you know, as somebody who I guess identifies as an introvert myself, like extroversion is a muscle and uh, yeah. you can build it up and, and you can go to that party and you can be, uh, you know, an interesting, interested person for two, three, four, five hours. Uh, and you gradually build up to that over time and then you can recharge. You can just go, you know, watch your reruns of like 1980s TV shows and read old books or play retro games, do whatever it is that you do when you're by yourself to just decompress and, and, uh, I guess re-energize. So exactly. Yeah, that, exactly. that's, that's good advice. I want to talk a little bit about your kids. If you don't mind me prying a little bit because you're a dad, I'm a dad. My kids are exactly 10 years younger than yours. I've got one that's six and one that's eight. Um, what are your kids into and like how, active have you been in trying to encourage them to learn about technology versus just letting them explore for themselves? They are not interested in computers, uh, which is fine. They are certainly competent users, but you know, the 16 year old is into football and he's into business. He's got a small business. 
Um, and the 18-year-old is into comic books and art, and neither of them have any interest in computers. And I haven't tried to f foist them, foist it on them. I haven't yeah. tried to like force them to do it because it's just not their thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm similarly like my kids are like too into, or my daughter is too into computers. She'll like grab my laptop and like start googling things, uh, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> So I have to like change the passwords on all my computers to keep her from like using my computer secretly. Um, but yeah, I am curious, like what are the main things that you've tried to impart to them a as a dad, like in terms of preparing them for the world out there? Because you've taken somewhat of an unconventional path that worked well for you and, and similar for, for me, uh, though I always tell everybody, don't be a fool, stay in school. I myself kind of was a fool and dropped out early on. And uh, I, I don't think that that was the smart call. <laughs> and I think that, that like I kind of succeeded in spite of a lot of my early mistakes rather than thanks to my early mistakes. Um, are there any kind of like general lessons you've tried to impart to your kids so far? That's a tough one. I think it's challenging because when you have succeeded in spite of something, in spite of going, you know, like I, like you've just pointed out that, yeah, you dropped out and I dropped out and I tried an unconventional path. Kids can use that as evidence of like, see, you know, I don't have to do this yeah. the right way. I think that school college exists to learn how to learn. That's all I got out of college was I learned how to learn. Um, if you feel that you can learn without, you know, college, then that's great. You've got that skill. Um, it is, however, a, a series of hurdles that people like you to go over, and at the end, you get paper. So certifications are a way to assemble a collection of paper that people will respect. And some papers people respect more. Certainly, if you go to Harvard or you know, MIT, yeah. you know, oh, my God, that paper has letters on it that matter more than that other paper. So MIT matters more than PCC, right, yeah. in my case. Um, Ten years into it, depending on uh, a lot of things in your identity, uh, your, the, the, the school that you went to matters less. You know, 10 years into it, people don't, don't ask. But people do get master's degrees so that they might be respected. People get PhDs and remind people that they have a PhD so that they might um, be, be respected and listened to. And that's, that's valuable. It's complicated. It's complicated. Like you made the point out if you don't speak English or you're an underrepresented group, you might feel more pressure to get a degree so yeah. that people will respect you. And as someone who's an old white dude, people are going to go and say, I don't even know where, where Scott went to school. I just assume he's smart because he's been doing this for 30 years, right? When in fact, I've been coasting on charm for decades, Quincy. <laughs> um, and, you know, someone's going to figure it out that I have no idea what I'm talking about. Do you, um, do you in, in all, all seriousness, kind of do you feel like imposter syndrome? At this point, still in your career? Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. God, I've written, I've written about it. It's I, I, I oscillate wildly between I'm amazing and they should pay me more, and I have no idea, and I just want to see if I can still have a job this week. Like that's that's my career is just oscillating back and forth between I'm useless and I know lots, and they should they should make me the president. <laughs> um, but like you know this floppy thing. Like there's a, there's a class of people. There's a, there's a, there's an age of people where I can blow your minds with the amount of information that I know about computer history. And then I go to my buddy Jeff's house and he completely blows me away with how much he knows about this stuff. Like I thought I was a nine out of 10 and I met Jeff and now I'm a seven and he just, he's, it's like grading on a curve. Like, you know, if you're in a classroom where everyone kind of sucks and you're the A student, you're like, oh, I'm amazing. And then you meet an actual A student. And then it's like, well, we're just going to go and reset the curve. We've, we've now met someone who's really tall, who can really dunk. Yeah. And, you know, and Jeff can dunk. So, like, I was like, wow. And I'm just, so I'm, what do I do? Do I get intimidated? No, I'm going to just absorb everything. I'm just going to suck as much information out of him as possible so that I might become better. Yeah, I 100%. That's how, when I meet somebody who I think is, smarter in an area than I am, I go full like a suction cup mode. <laughs> I'm like, let me have your knowledge, right? Feed me your brains. So 
when one of the things that is different about you and I growing up, and, and even though you know we're maybe like ten years apart in age, uh, I was born in 1980. Um, nowadays, when you grow up, you're not competing with the other kids at your high school. Everything, everyone, everywhere on the world is on this, this big world stage, like social media or someplace like that, and so you don't have a chance to really build up your confidence, like being the smartest kid in class when you know that there are people out there <laughs> that are dramatically smarter than you are and probably dramatically more successful than you are and better looking and, and uh, they have better singing voices <laughs> and all these different attributes that you might compare yourself to them on. Do you, like, how would you prepare your kids for a world where, you know, it's almost impossible to escape comparing yourself to the very best in the world? It's no longer about the like regional championships. It's like, are you in the NBA or are you not? You know. Um, what is it they say? Comparison is the comparison is the thief of joy. It just cannot be overstated. Like, like the you, the algorithm is designed to make you feel like crap, right? So if you go to Instagram and you get energy, and your Instagram and your TikTok algorithm is set up to make you feel inspired, I have curated my Instagram to be a positive thing. But 90% of the time, 95% of the time, it is designed to make you feel bad about yourself. So why do you keep going back there? Right? Like, you've got to stop comparing yourself to other people and you've got to start comparing yourself to yourself yesterday. Yeah. That's the only comparison that matters. Are you better than you were yesterday? Good job. Keep doing that. But like, there's always going to be some, you know the, the worst thing, man? Forbes 30 under 30. Yeah, I, I think that thing's toxic. That's I don't like worst, I don't man. like that ages that they apply to that because it's just what purpose does it serve other than to make people who are like in their forties feel you know like they haven't accomplished much in their time? You know, I guess maybe yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about TikTok because you have used TikTok quite a bit. It's a, a platform that I like was very skeptical of, like. To this day, I don't spend any time there, but, uh, you know, you, you, you're a creator and you go where the people are and like, how do you approach a platform like TikTok? Yeah. Um, it's about understanding the algorithm is there, uh, and it is doing stuff. Um, but it is not, it's default state is not healthy, but you can make it a healthy place. I, I find TikTok to be a very joyful thing. Um, I've, I have got mine is full of fun things and dancing and education and woodworking and it's just a joyful place. But it took me like four days to get it healthy for me, if yeah. that makes sense. And I think people, a lot of people aren't willing to, as you probably shouldn't have to, to, uh, to put in that work. But, but once you do it, it is really, really cool. It's a it's a really fun, joyful, joyful thing. Yeah. Um, and it also represents all of the diversity of stuff that I'm interested in. You know, I, uh, I have, I'm, I'm not just a programmer. I'm not just a, like a, a techie, you know, like there's I've, like mine, mine has excitement around Beyonce's album, you know, and it's got, uh, uh indigenous dance and it's got, uh, like I said, woodworking, 3d printing, like all the things that I'm interested in are, represented because I have liked the things that I like and I have consciously um, hit not interested yeah. in the things that I don't like. And that's, that's a big part of curating your space. Block, block and move on. Don't let the haters, you know, tear you apart it, and don't let it get you down. And if something is getting you down, get rid of it. Yeah. That's, like, that's a good approach. Remove it from your life. Like, don't let, random internet people who don't love you ruin your day. Yeah. I mean, it, it, a lot of people created YouTube accounts like 10, 15 years ago. So they may have forgotten that early on, like if you go create a brand new YouTube account, it's just going to be people like who can stop touching this million dollar car or like get, they win the cars. Like, like it's, it's, it's candy versus, you know, it's calories versus, um, uh, What's what's the thing about like nutritional value? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's empty, empty calories. calories. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, it's and, just empty. and there there's a lot of toxic stuff that'll get recommended to you as well. Uh but yeah. and, and I think that's every platform. That's just recommendation engines. That probably in my humble opinion as a non sociologist, non anthropologist, like 
that probably has something to do with like how a person who's very late, like tired at the end of a long working day and is just looking for some quick entertainment, like it probably quickly, the recommendation engine probably devolves to like the lowest common denominator, so to speak. It's not looking to teach you about engineering, right? It's not looking to That's teach you point. about uh, the history of some technology or to appreciate like art and music and things like that. It's probably just looking to get some quick laughs and help you kind of tune out from the, uh, you know, roughness of your day. For most people, life is not just like this, this amazing experience where they, the, people are cramming into the subways, they're cramming in the buses, people are doing subsistence agriculture all day, backbreaking work, they're working in factories. Maybe they go outside exactly. and the air is like unbreathable, right? Uh, there are like all these different, ad, you know, forms of adversity that people experience and a lot of people just want to escape. But if you go to the app, it's probably just going to try to give you escapism by default. It's not necessarily going to give you actualization, which is what you really want, right? Uh, it's yep, not going to give you exactly. a path to enlightenment. So anyway, sorry for like the long tangent on that, but I, I think it's really interesting that you've taken kind of like the toxic nature of these recommendation engines, uh, of these algorithms, and kind of like figured out a way to like course correct them. Yeah. If you know what what it's doing and what it wants to do, then let it feed you fun things and let it feed you happy things. Yeah. But also I have screen time turned on. I'm not joking. I've got like 15 minutes of screen time in each of those things and I have to put in a code if you know to uh to get more because I want a reminder like I just lost 2 hours. Yeah. It's the losing time part that's challenging. You don't want to lose a huge amount of time. Yeah, especially from like candy. Yeah, especially while your kids are still living with you and uh, you could be spending time with them, right? Priorities. That's all about priorities. And that's really the biggest part about adulting, the biggest part about getting into tech, the biggest part about all of this stuff is uh, are you spending your time doing the things that you should be doing? Yeah. Are you spending the time thinking about the things you want to be thinking about, learning the stuff you want to learn? You've got you've to be intentional. Yeah. And intentionality is a huge part of adulting. Yeah, having a plan. Like you discussed earlier, early on you didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan either. Uh, and now it well, sounds like you've got a pretty cohesive plan. I want to acknowledge, though, having a plan is part of it, but also acknowledging that I have a direction, a general sense of what I'm doing, but not a plan. Yeah. And I mean, like none of my career was planned. Paying the rent was the goal. And paying the rent is a righteous and valid goal. Yeah. 100%. Like getting, like if you, you don't have to be passionate about computers. You can just want to have a good job. Yeah. That's okay. And we should make sure that you're going to find people online that are going to say, if you're not working on software 24 seven, if you're not doing it as a hobby, then you're not a craftsman. Yeah. You can just want the money. Yeah. That's okay. Don't feel sad. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of gatekeepers out there, but those people generally are coming from privileged positions where they've, had the luxury of getting really into something for the sake of their own personal interest in it throughout most of human history. You know, you're a farmer. Are you really that interested in farming? Some people are, I know people that literally buy like farm simulators and they dream of eventually saving up money oh, yeah. to buy acreages so they can be farmers. But I don't think many farmers that are actually out there doing that are that passionate about it for them. It's a means to an end, you know, it's a exactly. lifestyle that they embrace, but they'd probably be excited doing something else as well. And that's, that's totally cool as well. And, and again, you can also switch careers. Another reminder. Yeah. You know, my wife uh, has an MBA and did a nonprofit for years. She was a finance person. And when she was 43, she just woke up one day and she's like, it's not fine anymore. I'm going to do something else. Yeah. So she decided to become a nurse. She went back to school. She got her degree. She became a, a 43-year-old brand new nurse. And now she's been doing it for like 10 years. And... um uh, she's been, she just the last couple of weeks, she's like, I think I want to get a PhD. So in the next five, 10 years, we're going to figure out some way to make that happen. Very cool. Like you don't have to pick one thing. You can always do something else. So I, I am, if this Microsoft thing doesn't work out, maybe I'll go work at Chick-fil-A or like, you know, Jack in the box. <laughs> I know I'd be a good manager. Yeah. Yeah. I always entertain fantasy going back I go to, to running ESL schools. Cause that's what I did before I learned to code. Yeah. That'd be cool. So I would be remiss. I know we only have a few minutes left. I, I'm going to fire off some rapid fire questions because speed. Uh, yes. All right. Speed dating. Let's go. So, uh, is C sharp a good first language for a beginner to learn? Like, do you think learning C sharp, learning uh, the .NET ecosystem, is that a good 
first language or is would that be like a second language and what would you recommend? Um, I think that it is a perfectly cromulent language. Uh, I like to tell people that they should learn two languages, JavaScript and a back-end language. Now, that back-end language could also be JavaScript, so you could learn two languages just by learning JavaScript. But that means you could learn JavaScript and Python, JavaScript and Node, JavaScript and Go, Rust, Erlang, C, C++, C Sharp. I think C Sharp is great. It's a language that I picked. It's my favorite language. It makes me happy. It lets you write websites. You can do things in JavaScript like Blazor, B-L-A-Z-O-R. You can write websites. You can write uh, Raspberry Pis can run uh, C Sharp. So yeah, you can actually go to D-O-T dot N-E-T, the word dot, dot net, and right there on the home page, you can run C Sharp in the browser and try it out, see what makes you happy. Um, and then uh, it doesn't preclude you from learning another one. So yes, good, good language to learn. Awesome. And if someone's, let's say they're already like a seasoned Java developer or they're a seasoned Ruby on Rails developer, they're used to doing full stack development, and they just started a new job where they're working with the C Sharp ecosystem, or they're starting a new project and they are interested in potentially using C Sharp uh, as their like mm -hmm. tool of choice for building this entire you know sophisticated app, how would you recommend they, totally they first get started? Like they've already got a lot of knowledge that they can potentially transfer if over. If you're like a Java programmer or you're already deep in it, um, I'm a big fan of just making a portfolio website, like make a homepage, make some brochure, make a business card. But the other thing to make you feel more, um, more passionate uh, is to pick a problem. Like uh, you mentioned farming, uh, a buddy of mine's got a little square foot garden out in the back. People can actually go and Google for Hanselman square foot gardening for programmers. I actually have a whole article about programmer minded square foot gardening. And, um, but they, they, they got a Raspberry Pi and a soil sensor and they connected it to the Wi-Fi and they made a little web API to tell them whether the moisture in the soil was a certain level. That's a thing. Um, I made one that told me if my garage door was open just wrote a little C-sharp application to tell me if the Raspberry Pi's orientation was like this, because the garage door goes up and then rotates. Solve a problem and do it in C-sharp. And that, that's a good way for like a Java person to, to go and do something like that. Awesome. Uh, this question comes from Gavin Lawn, big C-sharp YouTube creator, also works at Free Code Camp and teaches some of our courses. Uh, he says, he asks, People often ask whether Blazor may go the way of Silverlight and eventually no longer be supported by Microsoft. Gavin says he always replies that Microsoft is investing heavily in Blazor, but it'd be great to get confirmation of this from you, Scott. Confirmation that Blazor is a good thing? or That, 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 it's, that not... it's like a priority, I guess, is what he's trying oh, to say. Oh, yeah. Blazor's great, 100%. It's absolutely a priority. It is a really cool front end that lets you write, basically, websites without learning JavaScript. Like you can do interactions, you can you know, make uh, grids and tables and sort them and interactions and, and it, you just write it like you're writing a Windows app. The eventing and everything is handled by Blazor. So you get cool interactive websites without the stress of JavaScript. Awesome. And then I wanna, I'd be remiss for not asking you about Microsoft Learn, this massive library of tutorials that you all have over there. Oh yeah. Which we leverage heavily in the C-sharp certification. Uh, the, the foundational C-sharp, uh, hopefully the first of many C-sharp certifications that we're able to publish with so. you all. Um, what is your level of, invel uh, of involvement in developing these uh, tutorials? And like, how many people are on the team like developing these? Because it, it seems like an oh, incredible man. corpus of tutorials. I'm not directly, like, so Katie on my team helped, but like, there's a whole team of people making cool uh the, the cool stuff like this is all uh beyond me like there's a whole org i'm a partner for the learn team so i'm interested in c sharp and people being excited about c sharp so we partner with the learn team they make certifications they develop courses they revise the courses they make 100 level 200 level 300 level uh courses i don't know how many people are on there many yeah. awesome final it's question a, it's an area final question do people make their own luck Oh, ew. so I don't think people make luck. Well, this is a tough question. So I can make luck for other people. Luck is 
a, a formula, which is being prepared plus an opportunity. You can set yourself up to have an opportunity presented for you by changing your position where you are virtually or physically. You can be prepared for an opportunity to present itself, but you have to have the two things together. For example, um, you could work really hard and learn a, a programming language, but then if you sit at home quietly and never tell anyone that you learned it, you will not get a lucky phone call. It's not possible because there's no opportunity that's going to present itself. But if you learn JavaScript at Free Code Camp and then you're sitting on the bus and you start chatting someone up and you find out that they, are, they own a company and you happen to be ready because you've been practicing, then you've now had an opportunity plus being prepared and, oh, oh my goodness, what a lucky thing that I met so-and-so and now I have a job. Yeah. Right? So I can create luck as a person who's more senior by making opportunities. So I have the ability to invent and create opportunities and I have the ability to shine a light on people. So rather than mentorship, I can create sponsorship opportunities by retweeting someone's project, giving them a chance to speak on stage. And that makes the formula of luck more easy for other people. So you who are listening, think about ways you can be prepared and think about ways you can either put yourself in a position where an opportunity presents itself, or if you are in a position of some power, if you have level privilege, then how can you uh, create opportunities for those who are prepared to create their own luck? Amen. Kind of a nuanced answer. Yeah, no, uh, it's, I, I love it. Uh, Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure checking out so many of your cool retro computing projects, uh, hearing of your love of retro video games. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic day. And to everyone who, uh, who enjoyed listening to Scott, be sure to check out some of the links. I'm going to put some interesting links in the show notes. And until next week, happy coding.